Hello, everybody on YouTube and the UAP fam. We are here with another fantastic interview on another beautiful Monday evening, and we hope that you are all doing well today. I am Savita the Starsee. For those of you that are just now joining us, welcome to the crazy but positive side of YouTube, where we dive into what many of us feel happen to be the lineage of humanity. And for our guest tonight, we have John Ramirez. Some of you may know him, some of you may not know him, but John, if you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure, Savita, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a CIA officer, retired. I served from 1984 to 2009. And I was in uh, two directorates at CIA. The first was the Director of Science and Technology. And I ended my career with the Director of Intelligence. And during that 25 year career, I served three years in what is known as joint duty. That's when they take you out of your assignment and go do some other job that's related to your assignment, but with another organization. And that joint duties was with the um, office of the director of national intelligence in the National Counterproliferation Center. So I spent three years there. And then in 2009, I retired. Um, so I just want to say that um, I'm very happy to be here because to me, this is the most important topic. Um, not so much like what the, the delivery medium was, but more of the message that was delivered. And I think that comes through channelers and experiencers, especially experiencers um, who do not know each other yet seem to come up with the same story. Wouldn't you agree that we have sort of like the same insights, even though we have never met? So yes. I have to give some weight to that. Um, we say in intelligence, you know, that when you have uh, uh, one instance of something happening, um, you know, that could be like total like randomness. And if you have two, it could be coincidence. But if you have three, um, there's something to it. And so since there's so many of us who've had these experiences, um, I thought it would be great to talk to your audience, to talk to you about mine, and maybe we can share our experiences together. Yes, sir. I completely agree. We are way past the point of coincidences, though, I will say, because it's 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 astounding how so many of us, like you said, tend to experience the same thing. And it, it's beautiful. It's like unfolding perfectly, you know? It's definitely yes, it exciting. Is. Yes, and it seems that um, more and more the experiencers are reached out to each other. I think um, they're ex the experiencers group um, that's um, hosted by uh, Jay King and Stuart Davis, they had that. And so that's an, a, a venue for experiencers to get together and share experiences without that judgment that you get from our friends and family and, and coworkers, especially coworkers that we, want, we don't want to share that in that environment, especially when it comes back at you as being something is wrong with you, you know, and, you know, and you can't talk to a therapist either because the first thing they want to do is, oh, there's something definitely wrong with you and we want to medicate you. Um, that's, I don't think that's the solution to, to this at all. And I think it's more about getting together, finding each other and sharing our experiences, uh, very much for what you're doing, uh, uh, with, uh, having all of these interviews with people. Uh, about talking about star seeds to me that that's the most exciting thing because I think that's the key that will unlock all of the locks of why they're here and why we are seeing what we're seeing and why we're getting messages from them. Well, thank you for that. That means a lot. And honestly, it's it, it's it, oh wow, I cannot talk. Here we go again, guys. We're stuttering again. <laughs> I'm just gonna forget what I'm just gonna. <laughs> Well, anyways, uh, as we're going to talk about our Starseed experiences today, mainly John's, of course, because he is the guest on this channel, and it's going to be all about Mr. R Mr. Ramirez today. Let's go ahead and go down the outline, though. Uh, the first thing that I would like to ask you is if you could please describe your first paranormal or Starseed experiences uh, from the youngest age you were, the first memory that you could remember, and then up until now, if you can go ahead and tell us your story. Well, I think it's common for us to be interested in science, uh, in space especially. Um, and I grew up in the era of space exploration because so I uh, was a child of the 50s and it was toward the late 50s that we had Sputnik. 
And then we had the U.S. response to Sputnik and the space race was on. So we all remember um, the Mercury space program, the original seven astronauts. So when they were launched into space, um, it was a big deal for kids of my generation. We would gather and watch television. The one television we had <laughs> uh, for several classes, we would all get together and watch in black and white. They, you know, I watched Alan Shepard, our first astronaut, uh, do his suborbital flight. He went up and basically came back down, but it was 15 minutes and the launched a, like a lot of kids interested in, in science and engineering. At that time, the government uh, actually helped kids get into science and engineering um, with special programs. And it was tied to national security at the time because the Russians were way ahead of us in space. Um, but I was grew up in that environment where space was like the biggest thing. Um, so beyond that though, um, I've had other experiences like looking through my first telescope and kind of feeling that I don't belong in the planet. Like I'm a stranger on this planet and I got left behind. Like, what am I doing here? You know, and that's a profound thing to have when you're like four years old. But a lot of our experiences tend to happen at a very young age. And then like uh, the experience of having a medical examination, um, and I've talked about this before in a Victorian house where a doctor and a nurse would examine me. I was led to this house by a woman who was not my mother. And the house looked like very much like the traditional, uh, what you, you would see in period pieces, um, movies and shows about that period. Um, uh, these houses with the turret on one side and a wraparound porch. Um, and I really like that type, type of architecture. Yeah. And, and having an examination and having my mother tell me when I related this exam that there's no such thing that occurred. So at a very young age, I know that beings were interested in me for some reason. And then to have experiences with like opening a book and seeing an illustration of a, um, a primitive human couple, a man and a woman holding a baby up, the woman hold, held a baby up, that looked more like a, you know, like, well, I guess in the context um, that I saw it, that like 20th century baby. Uh, and the, uh, sky had two saucers above it with a light shining on the woman. And the message to me when I saw the illustration was, this is who you are. Uh, we made you, this is where you came from. And wanting to like get this book. And I closed the book and, you know, got my mother to help, uh, to buy it for me. And it disappeared. The book disappeared. And there was no one really around this book bin at this store. So what are the chances someone might have picked it up? Maybe, but I found it really strange that the book disappeared, yet that message came through. So that those are the, like the first very early experiences I've had. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's definitely not a coincidence that the book just happened to vanish and poof. Sometimes they tend to do that. I had an experience where basically something was moved without me doing it, and they like to do that. They like to throw you all these signs and give you these messages, especially at such a young age, because it makes you question and ponder for the rest of your life and allows you to have an open mind to this kind of topic. That That's really cool. Oh, wow. Those are some interesting experiences. Thank you for sharing that. Well, actually, to go down the to the outline, since you and I had a little bit of a pre-conversation before we started recording, uh, if you could slowly describe your Starseed Awakening, if you happen to go through any kind of, I guess, like downloads and like messages or how you realized eventually that aside from the book, how you did come from the stars solo. Oh, yes, it's a, it's an iterative process. I don't think it was like a one message that it said, oh, I'm from the stars. You know, it, it took a lifetime of understanding um, yes. and actually interpreting um, a lot of what experience in that context. So I had other experiences that um, led me to believe that I'm not from here. And that's the theme that I've had all my life, that I'm not from here. I was sent here to do some kind of work and I need to discover what that work might be. 
So um, the other experiences I've had are like actually being taken aboard a craft um, by a being going out the window. And there I felt like I needed to plant these sunflowers. So I got some sunflower seeds and I planted them outside of my bedroom window with sunflowers. Um, when they grew to be sunflowers, um, I felt that, okay, now they can find me because I put sunflowers out. So I don't know what the association is with sunflowers and experiences, but it, it really loomed large for me that I needed to grow these sunflowers. And sure enough, uh, one night, I vividly remember um, hands coming to take me away. And I was um, in my early teens. At that time, either I was like 12 or 13, and I was taken aboard a craft and held in a being's arms, uh, a very tall being. I didn't quite see the face, um, but we can get into this later. I imagine if I had a QHHT session, uh, the Dol Dolores Cannon modality for regression, I might be able to see that face, but right now I don't remember the face, but I remember going um, around in this craft and I know the craft was somewhat circular because as the being was uh, carrying me in its arms, I could see that the walls of uh, the corridor uh, was uh, moving in a, in a circular fashion as we were walking on the walkway in a circular fashion. So I knew I was like maybe in a craft that was somewhat circular. And I remember being taken to um, a examining table and being uh, placed on the examining table. And I don't remember anything after that. Um, but I woke up with markings on, on my groin area that disappeared. It, it didn't hurt anything. It just disappeared later. Interesting. Um, so I knew that I needed to reach out to get something. Like I wanted them to find me. Maybe I had questions. I don't know. Maybe they instructed me why I'm here, but I don't remember at that point um, what that might have been. But there's that experience. And later, um, I remember the most uh, relevant one was, uh, I remember being in some kind of a world that was not corporeal, not materialistic at all. It was all just like light and love. And it's hard to describe, but it's like beings of light. And if, if in this um, dream, I said to myself, I'm finally home. This is where I really came from. I came from this world yeah. and I don't want to go anywhere, but I was assigned to do something because the voice said, it's time for you to go back. It's time for you to continue your work. And who do you want to be this time? And I was shown um, like a infinite field, I would call it, of little uh, like spheres and inside each sphere, was some colored lights, smoky colored lights of various colors. And I saw one that was like blue and white swirling around. It's almost like blue and white smoke inside a, a little glass sphere. And so I imagine like a giant infinite egg carton with eggs placed in the compartments. I mean, instead of an egg carton, you have this big, huge, infinite plane with uh, indentations and each one contained a uh, sphere. And each sphere represented a life because I would look into each sphere um, and see the life of the person from, from birth to death. And so who do you want to be this time was the voice. And I selected one and I could see my life, the current one I'm living now, yeah. from birth to death. And I said, this is who I need to be. And I remember at that instant being born. And I remember being delivered and the voices of the doctor who delivered me and the nurses in, in the delivery room. So that was one where I couldn't connect the experience with what I'm supposed to do yet. And it wasn't until um, that I had a QHHT session where I made that connection. And in this QHHT session, and I think your readers would know that's the quantum healing hypnosis technique, Dolores Cannon's modality, um, I had a regression where I was actually a Victorian gentleman. He was a printer in Victorian England. It's maybe that's where the Victorian connection came in. 
Yeah. And this printer um, had a had a wife. And I remember um, at the uh, very beginning of this session, when the practitioner were like, uh, take me down from the cloud. And usually it starts with various visualizations. And the final one was sitting on a cloud and being very happy. And then um, descending from the cloud to the earth. And what do I see when I, uh, I'm on the earth? And so what I saw was fields of yellow flowers uh, swaying in the wind, a woman next to me who was my wife at picnic basket and we were having a picnic. I remember that. And from there, I discovered that I was a printer in an English village or town. Um, and my wife um, and I lived upstairs as most back then, I guess the, the business was downstairs and the residence was above. And so um, the wife um, um, was ill uh, from some kind of respiratory disease and she died from it because I believe it was the the powder and you know, ink or whatever they used back then, the the paper, um, the inks and everything caused a lot of respir respiratory problems if you breathe it in. Um, so she died, and um, then later I died, and so the practitioner had me as I was dying, um, and at the moment of death, I actually felt myself rising above. Um, my body and then the practitioner had me have me uh, had me look back at myself so i could see what i looked like and yeah. there they were the victorian doctor and a nurse um, oh wow i'm at the end of this life which is in the victorian period and i turned around she had me turn around and work what do you see and i i didn't see like a dark tunnel it wasn't like completely black it was more like a dark gray and I could feel movement, but I wasn't moving, moving at all. It was the walls of what I was seeing moving past me. So yeah. I was standing still, but everything was moving past me. So I have a sensation of movement. And as this occurred, um, it got lighter and lighter. So from a darker gray to a lighter gray. And up ahead, I saw uh, two light beings in the distance coming, and I was coming toward them, and they were coming toward me. And one went to my uh, left and one went to my right and they were my escorts back home. And this home was one of like light and love. I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. Um, it was just beings of light um, with like forms that don't necessarily uh, stay in one type of shape. Um, they, they're just energy so they can be anything. Um, I liked it there. I didn't want to leave, um, but I had to leave. And that's when, in this QHHT uh, session, the same voice, who do you want to be this time? So this was like in my adult years, this occurred in 2016. Okay. It happened before, I believe occurred like, like, like in the mid sixties, because I was a teenager. I was born in 53. So, at 13 years is 66 and that makes sense because that's where i lived um the 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 bedroom i had when i was 13 that's where the sunflowers were planted yeah so there were, so now 16 in uh 2016 and then going back to six, uh, 1966 that period of what is it 50 years i guess yeah 50 years uh, yeah, and that's when I was able to associate the QHHT session I had in adulthood, which was the beginning of the part I didn't understand, which was the dream I had um, as a teenager. So then everything came together. So that yeah. was the first instance when I uh, remembered that, oh, I'm here for a purpose. I have work to do. So what is that work? So um, next, and I still didn't know, uh, I got involved with a, um, a meetup in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I lived. And that's where I had the QHHC session in uh, 2016. I joined a, a meetup called Cosmic Empowerment. And these were people who are interested in the topic 
Um, many were light workers, some with a uh, good company, with yeah. light workers. And um, it was just amazing to be part of this group. And that's when I started thinking, well, I know, I know some things from what I did at work. Maybe I can put a briefing together, some, some presentation I can give to them. So the presentation I've done uh, for J of Project Unity, the part one of that was the presentation I did. Um, and, but still, I didn't think that was the reason why, th that wasn't the work I was sent to do. Um, and it wasn't until later that in 2020, when I moved to uh, the Tucson, Arizona area, that I did a, um, it's called CE6. It's part of um, uh, the uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind that Dr. Stephen Greer does. Yes. And CE6 is what Mark Sims uh, does with radios. So he, what he does is, and I have one right here. Ooh. So this is a radio uh, that can transmit um, over the uh, family radio channels. So you don't need a license to operate this radio. It's very low power, but you don't need a lot of power. <clears throat> and so what Mark does is um, he tunes this to 144.1 megahertz on your dial. I think that's right, 144.1. And he tones hue through it. Um, and prior to toning hue, I should add that um, he sends in a digital format some MP3. Um, and I'm not sure what the content of the MP3 might be. I don't know if it matters, but it's like um, it could be um, what we hear on YouTube where people uh, record these binaural frequencies that are yeah. close together or healing frequencies like 432. Uh, I think the other one's 528. Yeah, there's all kinds of binaural beats. And what he does is he, I think he has one um, that sends out many of these um, with some kind of tone and music. And he sends it out through this radio. And then he has several radios. And he takes the radio and he puts it in a bag. And it's a Faraday cage bag. You know, that is, you know, it, it, it blocks all signals coming in and out. Yeah. And it, you can test it because in here, in this bag, if you put it in the bag and use another radio to try to talk to it, it doesn't respond because it's it's isolated. Yeah. From the electromagnetic environment. So he has these array of uh, this array of radios out, and um, during that session, uh, we didn't have the radio then, but during the session, he um, toned hue after he sent out this, this, um, these frequencies, he toned hue. And like a few minutes later, uh, my wife and I saw orbs in the sky, an orb in the sky over the Santa Catalina Mountains in Tucson. And I saw it like straight ahead and hers was to her right. So she pointed to the wrong place. And I said, no, it's right there. So no, it's right there. <laughs> so that orb wasn't for her, it was for me. But she saw it. And the message I got was, you have, you know things, you have many things to share. It's time for you to share them. We're waiting for you to share. Um, you're a creator. You, you're a creator in a sense that you, you can manifest things. And um, we want you to share because you can manifest these experiences to people that want to hear from you. So okay, so that might be my mission. That might be why I'm here. So at that point, I took the first part that I did for Cosmic Empowerment in Charlotte, that first part of the um, of the presentation, part one, and I added the other parts to it, put it together. And because I'm a CIA officer, I just can't publicly show this. I have to get it approved. So here I am with this presentation, talking about orbs, talking about saucers, talking about Roswell, talking about some of my theories about, um, about Atlanteans and so forth. Um, and I go send it to CIA and see what they say. So I expected things to be like redacted, but none of it was. And they said, no, go ahead. Really? It's not classified. Go ahead. go ahead and share it with everyone. So that's what started uh, my journey. 
And I gave it to uh, Mark Sims. He saw it first. Um, and I sh and um, he shared it with uh, Danny Sheehan. And together they talked to me about it. And they got me, uh, Mark did, got me in touch with Whitley Strieber. So my very first interview ever was with Whitley Strieber. And um, that started a roller coaster of other interviews now culminating with you, Savita. Yeah. But a lot of these interviews, um, they want to know about what does the government know about these craft? <laughs> and I actually don't know what the government knows about these craft. I, can I don't think they know a lot, honestly. I think we know more than them. I, I think they know more, but they unacknowledge what they know. So to yeah. me, the UAP, the U is un unidentified. Uh, truthfully, it should be called unacknowledged aerial phenomena because they don't yeah. really share everything. They don't. And so I tell people, don't don't ask me because <laughs> I have no clearances. In 2009, I've had no clearances since. And a and lot has changed. Dealt with this topic as a topic. And I tell people, if you want to talk to somebody about what they might be, talk to Lou Elizondo, because he still has clearances and he deals with this actively. Um, but I don't. I, I don't have anything other than my experiences. To me, the experiences are more important. Honestly, so they are. Started me on that road of trying to share my, my experiences. I think that's the work I'm supposed to do, to contact other people um, who might have disturbing aspects of the phenomenon, disturbing uh, experiences. And not all uh, people who are taken have pleasant experiences and it might affect their lives. It might affect their uh, relationships with their friends and family. Um, so I discovered this organization called OPUS, Organization of Paranormal Understanding and Support. And these are therapists who are believers who are experiencers themselves. And so they will approach a person with issues with the phenomenon in a more um, sympathetic, um, more, uh, more toward outreach and sympathy and empathy and with the intent of helping that person understand why they may be having that experience. Um, and they're, they're not going to medicate you. <laughs> That's the thing that Thank you God. go to a regular therapist and say, hey, you know, I just got visited by these grays. They say, oh, something's wrong with you. Here, take these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. No, that's not, that's not the answer. So uh, I support organizations like that. I think it's very unique, uh, Opus is, uh, in, in providing this type of service to people with experiences. Um, so I, I really do support them a lot. And also, um, I mentioned QHHT. There's a QHHT practitioner practically everywhere, somewhere. I know we have several here in Tucson. My wife and I, um, we have a practitioner called Willow, and we invited her to our home uh, for a social event and talking about experiences. And sure enough, we, we talk about like these past civilizations from where we came from. Yeah. And um, so she's had her own experiences and um, also in contacting her clients, they also share similar experiences. You know that, yeah, I remember this life I had. I was an Atlantean, I was Lumerian, you know, um, and it goes back to them. And um, so that I think that's like kind of universal almost that we kind of feel like humanity isn't in and of itself just us, that we contain um, or we have within us uh, vestiges of all of these other civilizations that preceded us and they may have had some impact or some influence or some direct uh, uh, interaction with the way we develop. You know, I'm, I'm looking at that because, you know, I mean, as primates, we had the same kind of evolutionary time scale as all the other primates. And so if you look at an orangutan, a gorilla, a chimpanzee, um, you look at a bonobo, these higher order primates, and they're pretty much, unless you're like an, um, a zoologist, um, they, they're pretty much the same. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, if I went to and um, I'm conflicted over zoos because I like animals to be free. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you go to a zoo um, and you see the label, that's the only reason why I know that this is this type of primate. Because when I look at one, other than the obvious gorilla, you know, they all look like you know, like what we call like apes. And so um, we're not like that. Mm -mm. How, what elevated us to what we are today? That 1%, this is it. Yeah. It's them. Because yeah. the, it, even like for scientists for so long have been trying to figure out what that missing link is. Yeah. That small itty bitty bit that makes us so extravagantly different compared to the average primate. Well, it's this. Honestly, it's the star people. It's the star families. Like if you look back to ancient civilizations, they all depicted the same thing when mm -hmm. international communication was highly unlikely mm -hmm. and they all depicted people coming down from the sky with lights and sharing knowledge and passing their dna through it's that small one percent that makes us so different absolutely That's right. yes and it, isn't it interesting that many of the creation stories are similar yeah very similar and it usually starts with people from the sky came down through earth yeah and um, so in Japan, I'm part Japanese, um, mm -hmm. so I have a very interesting heritage. I'm kind of Spanish, Italian, Mediterranean kind of heritage with Cherokee, okay. Indian, oh, and wow. Japanese, I'm East Asian as well. So in, in, in the Japanese creation story, um, it was like a sun goddess that came down in some kind of craft that was very bright. And like that's why Japan uh, has a red ball on their flag. If yeah. you know, the fact that you know this is the land of the rising sun the oh. sun goddess came down and founded the japanese civilization um and so there's a place in japan that's very sacred there's a shrine there to this goddess who founded the japanese uh, civilization but it you know it came from up there to down here yeah and i i believe the anunnaki um is the same thing you know the the if you break out the anunnaki you know, it's like, you know, like, uh, like beings from above coming down to earth, like God from above in the heavens coming down to earth, the loose translation of Anunnaki. Um, so yeah, that's an example of how we're kind of universally like attached to each other yeah. through our creation stories. Um, I don't think they were meant to be religions at one time. I mm -hmm. think it was just a story just a story that was told over and over and over. Unfortunately, creation stories have become part of religions. And when it becomes part of religion, you attach to it other dogma to it. Um, and then that kind of messes things up. A it little does. Bit because people believe in that literally. So quick too. Like they believe in that very, very easily compared to something like this. They're like, oh, you're crazy. And yeah. Like, yeah, oh. yeah. It's not crazy to believe in messengers of God and where is God in heaven coming down? Angels of the Lord, where is the Lord in heaven coming down? They will believe that interacting with humans where it says, um, literally it says in the Bible that the people who encountered these beings knew that they were not human. They yeah. immediately knew that they're from elsewhere, from above. So Say it louder. <laughs> how do they know that? You know, because they saw them that they were yes. different from humans, but they will believe that. But when you say, yeah, I saw a being that came down and talked to me in my bedroom, they said, you're nuts. <laughs> you're, you're demonic. You're you need demonic. holy water. You need to be on medication. You need to be medicated. Uh -huh. so, I mean, that's where we're at right now, where, you know, there seems to be a split in ufology that, you know, you have people who just want to know about what's flying. They think about these metallic craft, you think about these advanced propulsion systems and these metamaterials, very materialistic. Um, and then you have people who um, are like channeling of turns and Pleiadians, you know, um, and, and having experiences. So I think it's all related. It is you know, related. I think it's all related. And um, for me, I, I had to divide it up into three categories because I had to sort it out for myself and I don't ask anybody to believe these categories. Oh, I'm, I'm, I need to say that I'm shifting around because I have this bout of sciatica in my left leg. So I'm 
find some comfort. So if your viewers see me shift around, that's the reason why I'm doing it. Um, but going back with the categories, um, to sort it out in my mind, I placed them in three categories because that's the way my brain works. I just got to sort things out. Um, the first category to account for high strangeness, like what was witnessed at Skinwalker Ranch, I call them the strangers. And I call them the strangers because we don't quite know who they are, what they are, how they manifest, or why they manifest in the way they do. And they seem to be uh, interacting with us in ways that harm us sometimes. Yeah. You know, maybe they don't intend that, but they're not, I don't think they know how to interact with us, or maybe they don't know that the way they interact with us might be causing us harm for some reason, because there's this, uh, there's the um, hitchhiker effect of this phenomenon traveling home. How does it do that? You know, how does something like that travel home to your home? And people have seen it. It was documented in the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon book about this hitchhiker effect. And there's some like, other disturbing things that happen health-wise to these people. Um, and I don't, I don't know if they intend that. I don't think they do. I just think that they're not quite on board with how to interact with us. Yeah. So I just throw them as strangers and they can stay there. Um, and it could be that, you know, they reflect um, our inner selves because if you send people from the defense intelligence agency, these researchers with instruments, and you're looking at something with the intent of, you know, what is it? It could be a threat because that's what DIA does. It's military intelligence and everything to them is a threat. They analyze stuff because it could be a threat. Yeah. So you see people with that in mind and here's this phenomenon reflecting that back to them. Oh, you think I'm a threat? Okay, I'm a threat because I want to communicate with you. So if you think I'm a threat, I will present myself as a threat. That could be it. That's just my personal explanation. I don't know. That one makes sense too. That theory makes sense. Yeah. So let's lump them into the strangers. And then I want to go to the residents. Um, the residents are like um, people who've been here longer than we have. They may, as I said, had something to do with, with us being here today. So these residents could be ancient civilizations. It could, it could be these civilizations that uh, may have in themselves created the Atlanteans or the Lumerians but they've been here a long time. Um, and maybe they broke away for whatever reason. And these civilizations, they may not be completely like um, space brothers and sisters. Um, in fact, they may have been here, this could be their planet. And yeah. they call them the resonance because this could be the home planet. And we're just the latest iteration of some variant of who they are. Um, and here we are. and. So the residents uh, have been here a long time. And in my mind, that's who's flying all of these metallic craft because they're corporeal beings um, flying these metallic craft and they're interacting with us because maybe we're, we're their children. They may think of us as their children and we're messing the planet up because they live on it too. Yeah, we kind of are. So I know um, that they're, uh, there have been sightings uh, in various places, which kind of hints at they're either under the water or in the earth. And so under the water, we, we have um, accounts of transmedium vehicles that go in and out of the water. Yeah. Uh, we also have accounts of sightings uh, over the poles. And sometimes they fly out of one pole and into the other. Um, that's there too. And uh, I know there have been videos of them interested in volcanoes. They go into volcanoes. They go into mountains. Um, so, I mean, to me, it's like, okay, they're like, could be at a point where um, they're on the earth, but they have ways of being interdimensional, um, using this planet as sort of like a gateway or something. Maybe there's more than one earth. And um, uh, we're messing up our earth and they're here on our earth. And um, 
um, they want to uh, advise us that we're doing things to hurt the earth, you know, climate, uh, nuclear weapons, wars, whatnot. Yeah, um, everything. Everything that we're doing. And maybe that's why they they want us to pay attention to them because we're at a crossroads now where we can literally destroy ourselves. Since 1945, we have the means of like destroying the entire planet and maybe them with, with along with them. So maybe they are interacting because of that reason. Residents, those, those are the residents. Now, I'm very interested in what I call the visitors, because these are the non-corporeal light beings that are out there that may have been in our corporeal form before, but they've evolved to um, higher, higher densities of existence where they don't need a body anymore, and they just are light beings. And I feel like when I meditate that there is a light being within all of us. Oh, yes within me and what i say is it's a being of light it's sentient in that it knows it's a being of light it's aware of itself it has a sense of itself and it has a sense of you and because it has a sense of you me um, we have a symbiotic relationship with this sentient light being within us and so in the past you know religions have called these beings souls so we can call them souls, but our higher self might be the slight being. Um, and I believe it's more like our own personal communications portal. Because when we do mindful meditation, um, you're using, um, you're utilizing the light being as a way of communicating out, outward to other non-corporeal beings, whether they be Octarians or Pleiadians. Uh, I think a channeler probably has a much more highly developed way of communicating through his or her own light being and, and able to then receive messages um, for us. Uh, for me, I don't, I don't channel, I don't receive messages uh, like that, detailed messages. What I have are uh, experiences with asking questions. So when I do my meditation and I bring all that energy back to me um, and I meditate, and I can sense this light beam. And through this light beam, I can ask questions. Um, some light workers call, the, call these questions cosmic orders, like ordering in a restaurant, a cosmic, in the sense that um, you can then you know, like actually manifest things. If you're looking for something, or if you are seeking something, you can manifest through your light beam through, through, to the cosmos. And then you'd be surprised what gets delivered back to you. And that's why, you know, they say, be careful what you ask for. Yeah, <laughs> some stuff will blow your mind. Yeah, people, <laughs> pray, you know, they, 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 people who are very religious in a traditional sense, uh, and they pray, um, they say, well, God spoke to me. In a sense, that's what is happening, that you're actually making that communication with, um, an entity that is of higher consciousness. And they don't realize it. And they don't realize it, yeah. They don't actually, that reminds me, if it's okay to share one of the downloads that I had. Um, so just to keep it short, I basically, Psalm 25, eighth grade was like 2008, 2009, something like that. I had, I've seen the entire 2020s and the 2020s people back in eighth grade. So I've seen you, Lily, Priscilla, like all the people that I've talked to back in eighth grade. But anyway, so one of the things that they told me when it came to religion was that it is extremely unfortunate that the people who are heavily religious don't realize who they're praying to and that they don't realize that it's us, like not us, but I'm speaking yeah. what they were saying. Like, mm -hmm. oh, it's really unfortunate that they don't realize who they're praying to, that they don't realize that it's us. But at the end of the day, they still have that internal light, that internal light beacon. And that's honestly good enough for us. And that's why they're still able to communicate. However, mm -hmm. some people mis, uh, misunderstand it as angels or God, Jesus, etc. But it actually isn't. And I'm not trying to like. I think he accidentally kicked himself out. One moment, guys. Hehehe. <laughs> 
I'm back. Something weird happened. <laughs> no worries. No worries. I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> did he have a power outage? But uh, basically kind of like that, yeah, um, that people don't realize who they're really praying to, but since they still have that love and light internally, they're still able to channel to them, basically, is what I'm saying, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. And they told me that. I was like, I mean, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense that they're still able to communicate to higher conscious be beings, but they really don't realize who they're praying to. Right, exactly. And um, uh, I think uh, the um, earth religions, the old religions, the ones um, based on the earth, probably they understood this. Um, because I know in Japan, um, the native religion of Japan is Shintoism, Shinto. And it's a religion based on an animism. That is that everything, everything, even what we consider inanimate objects actually has a spirit. Yeah. So there's spirits in, in trees, plants, rocks. Um, and so, and, and there's spirits in us. And we're all the same, like sharing the same spirit, the same energy. And so uh, in Japan, that's why they, with religious fervor, I would say, make these beautiful, simple gardens of a couple of rocks and rake the sand around it. And to them, that's like beautiful. The simple things are beautiful. If you look at Japanese architecture, it's very simple. I love very Japanese culture. Um, and if you look at uh, uh, flower arranging, you know, they can make beauty out of just arranging one flower. And it's the way the flower is shaped, the color, and the way it may be curved in its vase. And they will make purposely put very simple uh, other plants around it. But there you have just one thing. And to them, that's beautiful. So um, I, I do think that, that we kind of lost that, that connection to nature, you it know, did. that the old religions, the earth religions, what I call the pagan religions, and pagan does not mean you worship the devil. Thank it you. Mean that. Um, but I, I, if, if anything, people ask me, what religion are you? And I said, well, I, I believe that everything has a spirit. So, you know, what is that? You know, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I do believe that the connection to the earth um, is key in understanding uh, why they want to talk to us. Because modern humans, once we develop the technology, once we develop machines, once we no longer have to physically work to grow crops, where it was labor intensive to grow crops. It was labor intensive to grow our food. Um, now we have machines to do that, to do all of that. And we kind of like stepped away from this connection to earth and we worship technology. Technology is our God seems like, and it's no longer like um, connecting back to the earth, connecting back to nature, connecting to living things, yeah. connecting to the water everything on the earth, we lost that connection. Um, okay. But I, I, it feels like that's what they want us to understand, that we lost this connection to the earth. And so I want to like reestablish that connection to the earth. So I don't really have a religion that has a name other than, you know, I don't know, you, you can call it pagan, but um, I'm more attached to the earth. And to me, the earth is a living, she's living. I think the earth is feminine. I feel a lot of feminine energy coming from the earth. Yes. And she's a living thing like everything else. And she supports living things like us. Yeah. And so when the living things like us develop the technology to hurt our home, um, that's not good. <laughs> mm -mm. And I think these other residents who've been here longer uh, understand that. And that's why they're re interacting with us that explains why um, they tend to interact with our weapons that can destroy us, our, yeah. our nuclear missiles. Um, just to teach us a lesson, you know, that, hey, we can shut these off, but we're not gonna do it. It's up to you to shut them off. Um, so they demonstrated the fact that these weapons are useless because we can shut them off. And, but you need to do it. You have free will. You need to make the decision to reduce the 
uh, ability to destroy yourselves. Um, I think that's part of the message they're sending to us as well. Absolutely. Because we take advantage of this beautiful blue pearl and we idolize technology in such a terrible and toxic way. Like there are ways to balance technology with still being in touch with your like your native side. Like we don't have to solely rely. Like this is the one thing that kind of like eh, is when why do we have to continue to come out with plasma TVs? one of which now is smart without a remote. Okay, so what? Why don't we use the technology for other things that can benefit the earth and benefit our evolution? People are thinking short-term, not long-term when it comes to that. And mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking. And that's what I want to do is be able to utilize my engineering degree somehow and be able to turn that, I guess, whole situation in itself. Like where are the gigantic machines that are able to automatically grab all the pollution out of the ocean that we've left behind mm -hmm. or anything else you know stuff like that like we don't need the next best smartphone or another tv that's oh not remoteless okay <laughs> what's yeah. that gonna do for our grandkids and our great grandkids nothing right uh, yeah yeah it's it's um this connection to nature is so strong in me that um but, uh, you know, my wife and I, we love walking. And so we try to find like not a paved uh, trail or something like that. But out in the desert, there are trails that are right on the desert. You know, you can walk on the desert, walk on the earth. And it's a different feeling. You, you connect to everything, especially out here in Arizona, where you have wide expanses of just nothing but nature. And you see all kinds of nature's critters all over the place, you know, and yeah. and you get the sense that, okay, I'm sharing this planet with these critters. I know here in Arizona, we in Southern Arizona, there's a hoofed animal called a javelina and people mistake it for a pig, but it's not a pig. It's just a hoofed animal that kind of looks like a pig, but they're not, and they're everywhere. And people just leave them alone because, you know, they're, they don't shoo them away. Um, they go next door because they like the Sonoran acorns uh, from the Sonoran oak tree. And that's what they eat. They're everywhere. And they got these little tiny ones that are cute and big ones. And people just leave nature alone here in Arizona. Uh, yeah. because, because the way to survive in a desert is to understand that the desert is their home. And we're just the house guests. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you got to keep that in mind, especially when you're walking on the desert, because there are things that if you disturb their home, um, they're going to defend their home. And so, you know, usually when you you trying to provoke the, some of these desert creatures, they'll come back at you <laughs> and some of them can really bite, <laughs> leave a bad mark. So I think, you know, just understanding nature um, and, and reveling in nature is is great. It's just like walking through the trees and doing this the Japanese, um, this tree breathing exercise where Japanese people will walk through a forest and just breathe. And it's part of this, this exercise they do of connecting to the trees. Um, so I love that. And that's, that's what I like. Yeah, it's a beautiful aesthetic. Honestly, I might have think that but I think that I might have had a past life over in Japan at one point, because even from a young age, like, I remember when Mulan first came out, and I mm. loved every bit of the movie between the dragons, the statues, the structure, the architecture, the way of living is so beautiful to me. Like, that's honestly one of my favorite modern cultures that exists right now. It's yes, and, you know, and, and um, Japan is becoming more modern in, in the sense that, you know, they they have a love affair with gadgets and um, they make great gadgets, um, but they try to miniaturize gadgets, try to make them as small and simple as possible. And there's a, as, um, you'll appreciate this as a me that there's a design aesthetic yes. in, in, in Japan uh, and the way they design things. Um, Apple, I think, tries to do that. And in many ways, they succeed in doing that. It's just trying to make things as simple as possible to make it beautiful and functional. Yep. And I think that's the biggest challenge um, is to make something uh, both beautiful and functional at the same time. Yep. Whereas <laughs> in, the, in the U.S., we in, in the West, uh, we try to make it like big and like the bigger it is, 
the better it is. And, and overcomplicated as heck. Yeah, usually not necessarily the case. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I I appreciate your thoughts on that because um, I, I think that's that's part of the key in understanding what's going on with us and with them. Um, and I call them people because to me they're not aliens. Nope. To me they're like they're part of this planet. They're just other beings of high intelligence on this planet. And we're like the least intelligent of them. Um, and so uh, we, we pride ourselves on our intelligence, but by gosh, you know, there's so much we don't know. Absolutely. Like we act like we're the top dogs and the next big thing when in reality, um, we're actually all making really huge fools of ourselves. <laughs> like overall, I'm sure we're like a laughing stock or something compared to the rest. Well, of the yeah, and I'm thinking that, that instead of laughing at us, they they're kind of like, okay, we, you guys, you know, you need to understand who you are, where you came from, to appreciate, you know, what you're doing to this planet. Yeah, um, it seems like um, that's the lesson they're trying to tell us. Um, but they've been here a long time. And so maybe we'll understand what they're trying to say, because if we don't, it, it might have some consequences for them and us as well. It will. Um, yeah. So that's an avenue of exploration that doesn't get talked about a lot. It really but doesn't. I have colleagues, I uh, have friends who are experiencers, and that's what they talk about. These are like other CIA officers who are experiencers. They've retired now, and I have a very good friend um, back in Virginia that had these profound experiences with even um, uh, seeing a, a Marian, I guess you would call it a Marian vision because it's a woman in white with a message to him. And she talked about signs that we will see um, and we, she talked to him about uh, 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 humanity being at a crossroads where we can make a decision that will have consequences for us. And how, like, what they're trying to do is um, not uh, have communications with everybody, not all the 7.9 billion people on the planet, but enough so that the rest of us can help shift the planet. It doesn't take everyone to shift the planet, but you need a core number of people to shift the planet to higher consciousness. And it's sort of like this shift has been going on for a long time. And they, we have periods of shifting. Um, for example, the Renaissance period was a, a major shift in, in Western Europe and in, in Western culture. Oh, we're not flat. Oh, <laughs> the earth is not flat. And, you know, oh, okay. So the sun doesn't just stay up there and we actually go around the sun. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a new, new concept. And in fact, back during the classical period of, of Greece, um, that could have been a major shift because they were closer to the source of the information. Um, and they like, theorize the fact that there must be something so small that can't be anything smaller. So yeah. they call it the atom. And they had no means of testing or provide evidence of the atom. Nope. Um, so you say, well, okay, there's an atom. Show me the evidence. Well, we don't have evidence. It's a philosophical argument that there has to be something smaller than everything else. And that smallest thing is called the atom. That's part of their philosophy, right? Um, so now, and then, like they say, well, prove to us that UFOs are real. Well, you can see them, but I don't have one to show you. I can't, <laughs> I can't take you to one. It's not like fishing. I didn't just catch one and reel it in. It's not that easy. I've been on board one through a dream. Uh, if I had visions, I had experiences of being on board these craft. That's my personal experience. But if you haven't had that experience, I can't prove to you that what I experienced was real, but it was real to me. Basically. That's the best I can do, really. Um, short of like knowing anything more than that. I don't know. I just think that there might be craft that we have. I don't know. I don't know where it's at. I don't know if it's at Area 51 or where. 
Um, we might have that, but what does that prove? You know, that we have this advanced craft, but what does that tell us about why it's here? Where did it come from? Why are they interacting with us? Why do some of them crash or they're so darn advanced? Yeah. <laughs> you know, are, are Supposedly. Trying to, trying to tell us, oh, we're here and okay, we crash so that you'll notice us. We show up in the sky so you notice us. Basically. Um, yeah. But the orbs are different. They are. They are different. I think honestly that the metallic crafts are like a distraction and that the orbs are the real things we should be looking at. I, that kind I of makes think sense. so too. And part of my briefing was that we knew about the craft. Let's say Roswell actually happened. I think it actually did happen. And I think bodies were actually recovered, but I have no evidence and I can't prove it to you. But the orbs are things we see. And so the orbs are things that we saw with actual instrumentation from space. Uh, these satellites we have that can um, detect the presence of orbs because they're looking for energy, uh, like infrared energy. So we can actually see the presence of these orbs. And when we first saw them, that is we, the government, that's what sparked an interest. And oh my gosh, these aren't the saucers that we know about. These are the orbs. W what are they? So this occurred like primarily in the 90s when we developed these, these types of instruments that can detect orbs. And that sort of like regenerated this interest in this other part of the phenomenon, which I call the visitors. Yeah. Because, you know, when the higher consciousness beings, they don't require a spacecraft to come here. Mm -hmm. From wherever they are, they can say, we're going to Earth and they're here. You know? Yep. The, the, you know, faster than the speed of light is the speed of thought. That's faster than the speed of light. If you imagine yourself, and I'm doing it now on another planet, I always go to an ice planet. I just went to an ice planet. I don't know why I go to this ice planet, but they're here, they're on earth and they don't need craft to get here. But when they arrive here as energy beings, they manifest themselves as this, this light energy. Um, and that's why we see this light energy everywhere. They're everywhere. Um, so that's, I call them the visitors. They're, we're being visited. And uh, when people see these orbs, they tend to have profound experiences that change their lives. If they weren't interested in this before, they become extremely interested. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of being obsessed with knowing more. I want to know more of why I saw them and why am I getting these messages? Because there's Same. always a message that occurs. Um, between what they what people see and the person seeing it. There's always some message. There and is. from these orbs, they're not like, for me, not harmful messages. They tend yeah. to be more um, messages of kind of based on like unconditional love, if lack of a better term. Um, you feel, I, I've always felt like, like they're trying to reach me and teach me things. What kind of beings do you know? Um, I look, different people resonate with different higher consciousness. Um, I resonate with Lyrans. And um, I read about Lyrans. Um, I didn't know too much about them, but I knew about Lyrans first through a QHHT session. When the practitioner asked me, um, you see these beings of light, ask them who they are. And the L-Y came out, the L-Y. I couldn't quite piece it together. And I didn't know exactly what they said, but I said L-Y something, L-Lyceums, Lyrians, like, I don't know, L-Y something. And it's recorded in, in my QHHT session, I said that. You know, it's like, I think they're Lyceums. <laughs> um, so later- Licorice? <laughs> yeah, but L-Y something. And I later found out about Lyrans. And, and then it clicked. <laughs> It clicked because um, when you look at um, what characterizes a Lyran star seed, it, I've checked just about every box. This, this, this um, attention to detail, this interest in science, the ability to take complex um, ideas and visualize them and then explain it to others is something I, I've done. Um, I was at a job 
which I was not qualified for at CIA. I had absolutely no qualifications for this job uh, other than some military experience. Um, I have a political science degree and they put me in a job that requires electrical engineering, physics, mechanical engineering, any of the engineerings, math. And I had none of that. I'm, I'm terrible at math. That's why I can't be an engineer. I just cannot do math to save my life. Yet, um, I was placed in this um, office that required, and I was working with people with those kinds of academic skills, academic background, and I thrived to the point where I became chief of that branch. Heck yeah. Um, so, you know, I could like visualize, when they talk about electromagnetic energy, I could always visualize like seeing things as particle and waves. Yeah. Right? I look at something, I see everything as particles and waves. That's what they are. Um, so that's an example of, you know, like manifesting something from that lion type of star seed. Um, the interest in history. I love history. I want to know more about us going way back. Um, yep. See, my, my, my time travel fantasy is not going toward the future. My tra time travel fantasy is going back to the past, and I want to see the, the man and woman um, that existed, or a male and female that existed um, 50 million years ago to make me here. Yeah. Because if they didn't exist in whatever form they were in, I wouldn't be here. And whatever iteration of mating that happened <laughs> way back when, yeah. I want to see what their lives were like. Basically. Yeah. I want to see them and I would pick like a major period in time and then see like who was living at that time, the couple that was living that made me today and right now in 2022, who was living in uh, 2022 BC <laughs> that resulted in me 2022 AD. I like to yeah. go back and see, you know, I want to see their life where they live their children, you know, what they did for a living. I'm, a, I'm obsessed with that. I was, it's completely understandable. I mean, like that's like, like what I said with my galactic history video, it, it's been seven months of research and damn near 20 pages on a Microsoft Word document. Because when you first get down that rabbit hole, it's like impossible to get out because you just want to learn more and more and more. And when you dive so much further down that, well, from our perspective down the timeline, a lot of it makes so much sense that it it's there has to be some kind of meaning behind it, you know. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and if, if you, uh, I believe that in the quantumness quantumness of things, that um, all of this can exist at the same time in yeah. many different ways. Like, like when I mentioned, twenty twenty two B C is existing now. Um, it all happens at the same time because we we think of time linearly. But, you know, like I tell people, you know, there really is no present because as soon as your mind thinks present, it's already in the past. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you can think about the future. You can think about the far future and you can probably visualize the far future of where you want to be in like how many years. You know, the interview question that people that hire people always ask, where do you, what do you see yourself in five? Where do you see? <laughs> One of the best answers I gave is I see myself in your job. <laughs> that always disarms them. <laughs> They'd be like, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, I, I actually, that. oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, because I had a question um, that I just remembered. Um, when you were talking about going aboard the crafts uh, at a younger age, were those also the Lyrans? And I do have a follow-up question, but I'm curious if there was a connection there, completely different oh, they're beings. Lyrans. Um, they're corporeal beings. The interactions I've had were with corporeal beings on the craft. <clears throat> Anything that involves a craft, or um, I've had one where I was in a cave with small beings, and they weren't like the grays uh, as we, we would think. They're not like the gray that was on the book cover of Whitley Strieber's communion book. They didn't look like that, but they were small. And they didn't have the almond slanted eyes. They had round eyes, but they were very small. Um, and they they led me through the cave and I wanted to like walk away from them, but they said, no, don't worry, don't worry, you know, just follow us, we won't do you any harm. 
And I don't have much memory of that other than that experience with little beings. Um, but those are more corporeal. Uh, I think they're flesh and blood beings. I think, uh, I think if they get hurt, they bleed. I think yeah. they die. Uh, I think they mate in whatever form they make made in. I think they're just beings that are like us. Whereas you know, we are cognizant of our presence and we think we're on the top of the chain of all beings, that we are the superior being on the planet. I think we might be wrong about that. I think they're yeah. saying, oh, no, you're, you're just the kids. You're the new kids on the block. We <laughs> you. And we don't like what you're doing because you found the box of matches and you're striking matches. Mm -hmm. That's your weapons. And you don't know what that you can burn down the house. Yeah, you don't understand the consequences of some of your actions because you don't right. see the bigger picture yeah at all the the lyrans are more of what i see in visions in meditation in dreams and they're always light energy they manifest themselves with light energy uh, when i do a meditation i can i can sense that swirling of energy around me yes um the swirling of energy that was actually going to be for my follow-up question going back to some of the visions and downloads that you've had okay so with me when i was like maybe six or younger, I just remember having this one dream over and over of being in a completely huge white room, but it wasn't really a room. It was just a white space, like in the matrix. And I felt energy just like pass through me, but mm -hmm. it moved really slowly. Mm -hmm. And then with what you were saying about being able to pick your next life, it was kind of like that, but I don't know if you've had anything with like a white room and the swirling energy. Like I remember feeling energy just passed through my body very slowly like a sloth but it was in a huge white space it's like mm -hmm. they were cleansing me to get me ready for i guess the savita time but yeah like i remember you talking about that and i believe priscilla's interview and i was like oh my god i had that same experience so what's that swirl of energy well it Work. No, what's happening? <sighs> what the heck is going on? Sorry, guys, we're having mad Wi Fi issues right now. Wow. Okay. We're just continually having problems during this. No, I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know. It, it said my Wi Fi cut out. I'm like, how? It's still going on, but it's still recording. Thank goodness. Wow. Okay. That just, I, I was mortified. I was like, oh my goodness. Sorry, guys. Hopefully you could still hear us and hopefully everything's still going on. So we're just going to continue. <laughs> I deeply apologize for that. I don't know. That That's weird because my connection didn't disconnect. It just. I know. It's really strange that uh, that happened. Um, anyways, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess going on with like our, with our to do, well, not to do list with, with our outline, um, sure. going back to <laughs> freaking technology, man. Anyways, um, your current lessons or objectives while on earth. I remember you mentioning that you had to share and mm -hmm. that was your mission, but do you happen to have any other missions while you're here? Um, I think it's to reach out to individuals. Um, I know I do a lot of these interviews, um, but for me, it's more fulfilling to reach out to individuals. I've been contacted by individuals who are seeking help. And uh, for me, I love providing that help through connecting them to resources or I've had um, just conversations with people saying, I can't talk to anyone about this. Can I share my experiences with you? So sure, I'm here to listen to you. And all they want to have is, is just someone else uh, to share the experience with. And, you know, it's not like, uh, like um, they want to convince me that it's real or whatnot. I, I believe that they're all real. Um, but the fact that they don't have an outlet for it, they don't have family and friends they can confide with and definitely not coworkers. Yeah, nobody to relate to that can understand. Yeah. yeah, 
And so I'm here, you know, I, I'm interested in listening to people's experiences, uh, particularly because I get something out of it because there's so many of them um, are similar to mine. There's a synchronicity of these experiences that I've had that other people have had, uh, not, maybe not so much in the details, but definitely in the messaging it tends to be very common among experiencers. It is. And it definitely helps a lot of people like reassure that they're not going crazy. Like I actually had a guest on here uh, in the past and I feel bad. But I kind of made her cry in the end, but they were like happy tears, I guess, because she's like, this is therapeutic. And it's nice to know that I'm able to share these experiences to like minded individuals and that there are finally people that can understand her and believe her. Mm -hmm. And it makes a difference, you know. Uh, one of the next questions that I do have, and I'm not trying to like speed this up, and now I'm afraid those things are going to cut out again. <laughs> um, but I remember you mentioning somewhat of like your your gifts that you have, if you happen to have any kind of psychic gifts uh, between like clairvoyance, clairaudience, et cetera, or what you know that you have besides receiving messages per se. Well, for me, it's not one of the clear gifts um, that I can practice. It's more like, uh, things that happen to me, um, I don't know if you consider them gifts, but things that have happened to me are things that I've already known about prior to them happening. Uh, it's hard to des describe that. Like like a knowing. A knowing. Uh, yeah. For example, when I was small, um, I was interested in um, electronics. So I was like taking apart the family radio because I want to know how it worked. And uh, this dates me, but it was a vacuum tube radio. <laughs> oh you know, I just want to know how things work. So I thought I may have had an engineering streak in me, but um, an engineer knows how to build things. I only knew how to take them apart. <laughs> I couldn't design anything. I couldn't do anything like that, but I was always interested in how things worked. Yeah, I knew I was in, I was going to go into a field dealing with electronics because I had a passion for that, knowing about electronics. Um, so I had a chemistry set when I was younger, and I had a microscope um, when I was younger. I had a telescope, of course, and I had a lot of like scientific toys, I guess you would call it, because I had interest in science and technology and engineering. So I knew I was in a field like that, and it's particularly yeah. radios. So I had something to do with electromagnetics. Um, You're already so in tune with the frequencies. Yeah. Literally. I didn't know then um, where it would lead. I, I was interested in the ocean. I was always drawn to the ocean. And so I felt like I was going to be in the Navy. Um, so that was one. And the other was one time we were in Washington, D.C. when I was like six or seven years old. And we got lost in Washington, D.C. And we went through a campus. And I told my father that, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to go to this school. And I didn't know what school it was, but I ended up at that school. It was the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. So I, I went to that, that. school. Um, I was always interested in, along with electronics, always interested in, in like politics. Um, but I was a child of the 60s. The Vietnam War was raging in the 60s. And the 60s was a decade of turmoil. Um, we had so many political assassinations. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Or, um, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. We had the uh, President Kennedy assassinated. That affected all the kids growing up in the 60s, plus the backdrop of the Vietnam War. I learned about Vietnam War when I was very small in a paper called My Weekly Reader that they used to distribute out to kids to help them read. And I heard, learned about this place called Vietnam. Little did I know that, you know, as an adult, I'll be on, in the Navy off the coast of Vietnam as Saigon was being evacuated. So, you know, that was part of that experience um, of being interested in politics. And so I majored in political science. And I knew I was going to be in CIA because when I was seven or eight years old, um, I had to write an essay, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I wrote down, I want to be a spy. And so all of these things lined up to most recently, um, when I started going to UFO conferences, uh, when I was still working at CIA uh, with a friend of mine, also at CIA, and we went on our own dime. We paid it for ourselves. We weren't officially there. 
um, but we just had a personal interest in, in ufology. And I told him, um, you know, someday I'm going to be up there on stage because I know things and I'm going to share what I know. But I don't know from that perspective way back then. I didn't know how that would be. Well, like a few weeks ago, I was standing on stage presenting my slides to uh, Phoenix MUFON. And I was sort of like a fulfillment of that, the visualization of me standing up on stage. Oh, uh, so a lot of things I've manifested have come to pass. It's not because I have any, I don't know if I have any gifts, but. I would consider that as a gift between like manifesting, but I think it's clairsentience, just the knowing aspect. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes. I haven't really explored it because I never like thought of myself as having a gift that could be named. So I'll, I'll, I'll do some more research into that. I just, for yeah. me, it's like a personal gift that, you know, for me, it's personally fulfilling. Yeah. You kind of have a direction in life. Um, I would say this, um, ultimately, um, I, I tell people, if you're on an airplane with me and we go through turbulence, don't worry about it because that's not how I'm going to die. Because remember, I said that I saw my birth to death. Yeah. I'll have a strong hint of, of when I'm going to die. And it's nowhere anytime soon. So <laughs> well, that's I'm, good to know. <laughs> I'm really confident that would happen. In fact, um, there were certain numbers that appeared uh, throughout my life that was the actual year of my death. And, and it just appeared out of context in some other form. And there's that number that keeps coming up again. I'm and curious so, like to ask what like the number is, but, but if you don't want to talk about it, I completely, completely understand. But that's like interesting to know that you have these knowings of your entire life. It's like you yeah. remembered what you were shown above uh, mm -hmm. when you were in that room picking your life. Right, exactly, yes. And so I think what I'm doing now is part of the mission is, is just to like talking to you, for example, Yeah. was part of my work because talking to you, I'm reaching other people that I don't see right now. I'm seeing you, but you have an audience that um, your audience is listening to us. And so I just wanted to share with them yeah i do appreciate them i do They're, a lot of them are very sweet very unique individuals and we all have a purpose on this planet we do um but i am curious uh what is so, so if like somebody i'm sure you've had this throughout your life somebody would come up to you and they'd be like prove it to me and i know that's like kind of like a touchy question but what would be your best piece of evidence if somebody came up to you and wanted some kind of proof what would be the best thing that you would be able to provide proof of, uh, proof of craft proof of experiment. like like light beings and all of this uap stuff yeah all yeah, this i i tell them that um a light being is a non-corporeal corporeal entity of energy and that energy is unconditional love and if you want to see the proof of that hold a baby in your arms and look into its eyes. Oh, that's a you, beautiful you, response. And it doesn't have to be a human baby. Hold a puppy, hold a puppy and, and look into its eyes. And you'll see that unconditional love through the eyes of animals and other human beings. That's what I say. That's beautiful. Oh, I'm gonna cry. I love puppies. <laughs> Um, oh, wow. Well, well, I do have one more question for you. Well, I mean, I might have like maybe two more, but for at least for the outline, um, do you have any sources or tips or advice for those who are still maybe going through their awakening? Awakening can be taken as in spiritual star seed or just overall having an open mindset to this entire topic. What would be the best suggestions? Yeah, uh, uh, many phases. First of all, um, we need to take care of our bodies better. And so uh, I would say, you know, let's take care of the, the receptacle or the temple of that light being first. Um, look at what you're eating nutritionally, uh, make better food choices. Um, it's, it's, or, I know organic is very expensive, but there, there are many foods that are grown organically without having that label organic. So uh, most grocery stores will have, it's sort of like an upper tier of their store brands um, that are not, these products are not organic, but they're grown 
um, organically in the sense that they don't use chemicals, they leave things out. They have a list of things they won't put in their food or grow their food with and look for um, those types of, of food choices. Um, and I also say um, explore uh, taking care of your body without using uh, drugs, if at all possible. I'm a big proponent of CBD, um, and I use CBD a lot. Um, that's been helping with my sciatica as well. I use a CBD cream uh, for that, and I found a good source for it um, back in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So look for ways to heal your body without using medicine because the pharmaceuticals are, they won't tell you, they're plant-based but they're synthetic. So it's amazing that botanists are hired by these pharmaceutical companies to go out to these remote regions of the world to look for these plants that they know have medicinal properties. Living here in Arizona, we read about the native indigenous population using the plants in the desert as medicine and food. So there's, there's like so many things that you can do for yourself physically that will help you be a better receptacle. Now on the spiritual side, I tell people to have a meditation practice of some sort. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Just find some quiet time. And it's so hard to quiet one's mind. Um, sorry about that. No, no, you're good. I was dancing to it. <laughs> Our technology today during this little stream is just like, hello. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So have a mindful meditation practice. It doesn't have to be perfect yeah. at all. Um, but just take some time out and have some kind of mindfulness in your life. Just take a minute out. I mean, I have um, an Apple Watch, and on it there's a, a mindfulness app on the watch, uh, mindfulness complication and one of them uh, is just like one minute of quiet time just take one minute of quiet time and it plays like nice little swirling colors that you can look at Aww. but just do that or there, there's a one minute of breathing of a certain breathing pattern and the watch will tell you how to breathe you can feel it tactile when to uh, inhale when to exhale and that helps a lot. This breathing helps a lot. Breathing um, and more. diet. Oh, and and that and all of that above. Um, I think it's it's preparing your body for that. I know that more advanced you know, people do um, this this fast breathing exercise. That you can do this this very fast um, breath work, as they call it, where you're actually taking in oxygen at a really rapid rate. And people have, um, have actually had some benefit of like putting more oxygen into their bodies. And of course it's facilitated by someone who's trained for that. So you don't wanna knock yourself out by <laughs> hyperventilating. So on the spiritual side, um, to continue with that, to, the meditation is very important. Finding time for yourself to meditate, finding time alone to meditate. It's hard to tune out the world. Um, just Listen to, um, there's a lot of good uh, music on YouTube that are, are for meditation purposes. Some of them incorporate those healing energy frequencies with the music, and that helps you like drown out the noise in one's head um, and be more receptive to messages. Um, I personally, I, I met a light worker her name is Glenn Younger with two N's, Younger. She's in Vicenza, Italy now. Uh, but she has a wonderful meditation practice that she has on YouTube. And I follow that. It's uh, She's a uh, part, uh, part of it is in Italian because she's in Italy. So she has one that's all in Italian and one in all in English. And through that, the, what I describe of imagining all your energy in a ball and sending it down to the earth, to the cosmos and back was part of part of that. That's, that's who taught me that, how to do that. And um, so that's, that's what I would recommend. 
Diet and meditation is like the most important things. And a lot of people don't even take their diet into consideration and don't understand that certain things that they're putting into their bodies. It's like, um, you shouldn't be doing that. Like I know people that will literally pop breakfast with the Dr. Pepper and blue Takis. I'm yeah. just like, oh God. And I'm so glad my mother raised me on organic. Yeah. And I, you know, fought for her about it at first because I loved ice cream, but I thank her for it. Yeah. Oh, you, there's healthy ice cream. <laughs> well, well, like, if, yeah. well, because at the time, uh, at the time, my dad was diagnosed with um, Hodgkin's lymphoma stage four. Luckily, it's not fatal. He's still around now. Um, mm. So she completely educated herself and switched the diet over. No more Oreos, no more junk food. Everything was yeah. fruits, veggies, yeah. Yeah. and it, it was a blessing in disguise, honestly. Yeah, I know. Um, we we like this keto ice cream that doesn't have any sugar in it and so um the, i i tell people don't even look at like artificial sweeteners um we our food is sweetened with monk fruit or um, the stevia plant yes the two sweeteners that we use um here at home and um so they're, they're making products with those sweeteners in them and they're a little bit more costly but you know i mean an investment in your health is not money wasted it's I, not you get to live longer, have a healthier mindset. You're less stressed. It's 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 a blessing in disguise to be educated on that kind of stuff. Right. So that way you're not terrorizing your health for your future and your future children, assuming you're going to have kids and all of that jazz. So so tempting to buy a box manufactured by big agriculture, <laughs> all the preservatives, so they'll have long shelf life. Yeah. And it's like reading a chemistry formula. If you don't know what this substance is, don't buy it. it, it basically. You look at the label and you don't know what it is. And you have to look it up. You know, it's probably not good for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Learning how to cook, you know, is, is, is great. I mean, I, I use that as a mindful meditation practice. I just go out in a different zone when I cook. I love, yeah. I love to cook. That's how yeah. I relax. That's my hobby now is cooking. Honestly, it's slowly been kind of the same to me because uh, my boyfriend and I, we've been together for two years, met in engineering. And we just got a house to rent because forget apartments. I'm over the apartment life. And I've slowly been getting into cooking. And usually I wouldn't cook. But I make this interesting contraption that has rice, two types of beans, uh, spicy sausage, organic, collard greens, and all types of seasoning and spices. And it's like this oh big gumbo. And it's amazing. It's so good. It's yeah. So good. <laughs> spicy sausage. I, I like chorizo. Yes. Yeah, and I love chorizo. And chorizo sausage. Yeah, yeah, chorizo is really good. Yeah, so that's that's part of my the uh, Spanish heritage in me. Yeah, like. uh, también because I'm a, a Boricua on my mom's side, even though I'm not exactly fluent. But yeah. I, I love yeah. spicy food. <laughs> well, I do have like one more question, just out of my curiosity. Yeah. Sure. But if you would like to share anything else afterwards, you're more than welcome to, and we can bring this to a close. Mm -hmm. um, I was watching one of your interviews. I forgot on whose channel, but you mentioned having downloads. Um, and yes, the term download is well known in our side of the spectrum. But you mentioned something on how we were enhanced with other DNA. I'm curious what other kind of downloads you've had or if you have a specific download that's very interesting to share that you feel people need to know about. Well, yeah, let me address the other DNA. That wasn't a download. That was a briefing. That was an official oh. briefing at CIA. Oh, okay. Um, it's very controversial because I have no evidence to present. Of that. When you have no evidence, people disbelieve, but that's fine. They can disbelieve. Yep. Um, but I provided the names of the people sponsoring and providing the briefing, as well as two other officers I recognize that were there. And I provided them to um, some well-known uh, researchers who, if they choose to, can pursue this further to ask them if this briefing actually occurred. So the uh, DNA in the human genome was briefed to me officially that it was discovered um, uh, when we were able to sequence the human genome. And they went back and they discovered that what was in a life form, recovered life form, is in us. Um, oh. So that 
was the briefing. That was not a download. That was actually um, a high-ranking officer telling me that in this in this meeting with other uh, high-ranking officers and uh, many many uh, academic people from various universities. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And oh, so, that's badass. That that. Um, but having said that, um, through uh, my experiences, my personal experiences, I, I know that to be true. I feel it. And it explains so many things. It explains like the missing link. Yes. It explains a lot of religious texts. Because if you are um, of a, a Judeo-Christian background, if that is your belief system, it's based on Judeo-Christian beliefs, and you read Genesis, you will read that a divine being, not from earth, created humans and there are so many connections yes and so in the text it says that this divine being spat upon the the mud and out of the mud fashioned adam the first man and adam adam's rib became eve um, they will believe that before they would believe maybe we were visited a long time ago by these advanced beings with means to come here I think Jesus was a light being. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe they had some uh, input into how we evolved Yeah, uh, from another life form that was more primitive. And maybe they enhanced us. They did no, completely, completely throw that out. So that's ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. See, what happened was God spat on the mud and fashioned Adam out of the mud. And Adam became a man. And Adam, Adam was lonely. And out of Adam's rib, uh, he created the first woman. They will believe that, you know? And <laughs> yeah. so, you know, and say, okay, so that was the first two people on earth. And say, yeah, that was the first two people. And say, where are the rest of us come? Well, they had children. Well, so wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me the brothers and sisters made it with each other in the same family and created us? It, they can't go there. I know. Because <laughs> then they say, oh, that's a sin, incest and all that stuff. It's yeah. Like, oh. And so who are the Nephilim, you know? Uh, I think it's like more like metaphorical, like you have yeah. the male and the female kind of right. thing, like multiple, right. that they're calling the male figure, male figures, Adam, and the female figures, Eve. I don't think exactly. it was just two. I think it was yeah. more than one. More than that. I think it was um, just talking about mainly just the genders. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, like the Nephilim, you know, like uh, the, the sons of heaven came down to earth and saw the daughters of man to be attractive and made it with him. And created a race of other beings, you know. So, but they're still talking about people coming down from above. Yeah, yeah. Like so, there are so many connections, but it's unfortunately misunderstood and thrown in the complete opposite direction. Right. right. Uh, so you know, just even that, you know, that um, as part of uh, my meditation, that to me that seems to be so true, especially with the QHHT sessions that I've had where I was in a light being world of other light beings, you know? And so it sort of makes sense to me. It does. It makes sense. It makes the orbs make sense. They're, they're yeah. energy. They're not like metallic craft mm -mm. with landing gear that land, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and out comes this, you know, being. Like ET or something. <laughs> yeah. So it explains so much. And so this, what I did with this, um, the residents, the visitors, and the strangers, those three categories, that's my way of connecting my dots yeah. um, to explain for myself, not that I care anybody else believes it, but for myself, it makes sense to me. And so I'm more interested in the visitors, more interested in the visitors, because yeah. I think they're like uh, beings of higher consciousness that no longer need bodies like we have. Nope. And maybe we will someday become them, but they bring to us part of their energy and the light being within us. And these light workers, what they do, why they call light workers, their job is to help us understand, to recognize that we have these beings and how these beings can help us in our daily lives to communicate uh, out, provide us with answers and how we deal with other humans. If we look at other humans as being made of light and they're light beings, you know, we can solve so many of our problems. Um, 
with dealing with other humans. I mean, we can't even get along ourselves. Look at this war in Ukraine. We can't even get along ourselves. It's and ridiculous. So, you know, you know, so we're just a, like a planet of like primitive tribes, intertribal warfare. And they're coming down as like much higher consciousness beings looking at us. So, oh my gosh, look at, you know, look at these people. <laughs> look at these idiots down here. What are they doing? <laughs> and so, you know, it's part of this awakening process, I think, is recognizing the fact that there are these other light beings that have our best interests at heart because they understand that they used to be corporeal and they understand that there were conflicts when they were corporeal. But through their um, uh, evolution, evolution of spirit, they were able to ascend and get rid of these corporeal light uh, bodies and become light beings. Um, but what's inside me, um, the messages I get, this light being is eternal. And when this body dies. Oh, you keep going. Yeah, it goes back. And it may have to do more work and come back in someone else. Um, I prefer to stay up there. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I, I'm tired of coming back. I keep telling them that. Please don't send me back. Whatever you do, well, send me to another planet. Something. Uh, somewhere else. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So basically, that's it right there. Um, to me, that's what's most important. Yes. And um, star seeds, I totally believe that we all manifest certain aspects of these other beings what we call star seeds. So we are made of star dust. Basically everything is, you know, you look at the sun, you look at all the stars, you look at the basic elements in these stars, they're inside us. So we're literally like made of stars. And yeah. uh, so I think um, that awareness is what uh, the work we need to do uh, to help raise the consciousness level of the planet, shift it out of, this tribal warfare kind of mindset, this idea that that well, we're we're humans and we have dominion over the earth, we can do anything we want, and that's not right. You know, I mean, just yeah. like, we're part of the earth. The earth is part of us. We're made from the earth, and the earth is made from us. You know, when when we die, we turn into dust of the earth. You know, um, so but what lives is this light being that continues forward. So. That's the message I have for everyone. That's my message. And that's the message I was, uh, I believe I uh, needed to share. I think that was the message that was told to me that you know stuff. And you know stuff about the nuts and bolts, but you also know these other things that you need to share. And you'll have a means to share it. And in 2020, I had no idea. No one knew who I was. I had no idea how to get from there uh, to where I'm at right now. It's interesting. It's like as soon as the clock hit COVID, everybody started waking up, but it was all done on purpose. I'm gonna have to tell you about that after we close out because I don't want to keep you. I don't. I don't want to, you know, keep you in pain. I feel bad, but I I love your messages, your stories, and I completely agree. Like there's something here that more than meets the eye, and we were practically sent down here to be prophets. I'm not trying to turn this into an egotistical thing, but we're practically like the Avengers and Marvel mixed with you know the with like the reputation of a prophet to get the word out there and get the message that hey our moms and dads are coming back and that's something they told me up there is just recruit who you can don't worry about the haters because we're coming back either way they were literally telling me that so it's we believe it our community believes it people that resonate with star seeds and the alien souls even though they're not really alien but they absolutely agree with that message. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Of course. It was very, it, it, it's just so reassuring to know, like I said, that there are like minded individuals out there. It, and everything's unfolding as it, is, as it should, because everything happens for a reason. Everything's already planned out. And who knows where the world will be in five, 10 years. That's why we're waking up now because yeah, it's going to take time, but once more and more people realize it, it's going to be exponential mm -hmm. and then we'll shift. Right. So. Yes. Would you like to share anything else before we close the stream? No, I just, I just want to encourage people to uh, basically um, to find a mindful meditation practice. I'm sure many, many folks in your audience right now 
have that already, but for those who don't, um, that really is the first step. Take care of your body and then take care of your spirit. Yes, it's very important, especially if you want to live for a while. <laughs> oh, camera, don't, don't, don't unfocus. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Ramirez. And thank you to everybody who's been watching the video for later on. Yes, it's pre-recorded. But I would just like to say again, thank you to everybody for wanting to get their stories out there and giving us the reassurance for each other and being there for one another. And be sure to go ahead and share the content at your own pace, whatever you would like to do, because we need to get this stuff out there. And we appreciate your time and we love you. Love and light all day. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Ramirez, for joining. And I would like to bring you back on in the future if my camera starts focusing. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank of you. course. Goodbye, YouTube fam. Stay safe and protected. And we'll see you next time.